Hello, and welcome to lecture 20 of AMAT 502 at UAlbany. Today, we're going to talk about, in, in my opinion, one of the most fun classifiers that we have in data science. This is the uh, naive Bayes classifier. Um, so as a quick outline for where we're going today, I'm just going to give you a, a more formal review of probability than the one that we used in the previous lectures. <clears throat> it's going to set us up for a good definition of conditional probability, which is necessary for discussing Bayes' rule and consequently Bayesian probability. Bayesian probability is now the sort of preferred method for discussing or at least discussing results um, in data science. So I encourage you to get familiar with its language sooner rather than later. Finally, we're going to end with one of my favorite applications, which is the uh, news group data set. So at a high level, um, you can think of Bayesian classification as basically trying to use probability to determine class labels. Um, so as before, we've got you know, some observed um, uh, features, and then we're trying to use those observed features to then guess what's, our, what's the corresponding class label. You know? Naive Bayes models are, are group of very fast, simple classification algorithms, and they're, because they don't really depend on geometry as much, they are suitable for high dimensional data sets. You know? And of course, in order to actually apply Bayes' rule, we're going to need to make some somewhat naive assumptions uh, for how this data is generated. And so this is the where the naive comes from in naive Bayes' theorem. All right, so as a quick review, we're going to go through uh, Kolmogorov's axioms for probability. So in the 1930s, Andrei Kolmogorov, um, very, very already famous uh, Russian mathematician who had basically been doing mathematics since a very young age. Um, uh, shortly after finishing his thesis and um, then going on uh, to take a position at the university, he did his PhD, which is Moscow State University. Um, he wrote some foundational texts on probability theory. And a lot of these just involved making very formal uh, the notion of, of events, which we want to use to discuss um, the probability of events occurring. Um, so the basic idea here is we have some sort of universe of possibilities. Um, this is what's called a, our, our sample space. And we often denote it with the Greek letter omega. Um, probability we can then think of as a function which is only defined on certain nice subsets of the sample space omega. Um, so at a high level, you can always talk about probability when you have at least the following three things. The sample space, omega, a collection of subsets, um, which I have using this math cal E um, of omega. And these are sort of our nice subsets. These are, this is our event space. Um, and then this P, which is our probability function. The probability function assigns to subsets of omega probabilities, but only certain nice ones, as we'll, we'll see here. So Kolmogorov's sort of insight was that you need basically three uh, axioms in order to get probability theory off the ground. Um, the first axiom is that probability is non-negative, uh, i.e. for any uh, event, which we think of as a nice subset that belongs to this collection uh, curly E, uh, probability of that event has to be non-negative, meaning greater than or equal to zero. Additionally, we want that the probability of our sample space, so this is the probability of anything happening, uh, is one. So you think of one as 100%. Um, this basically says two things. One, that omega is one of these sort of events that can happen, um, meaning anything can happen. And additionally, that the probability of anything happening is one. And then additionally, and this is sort of the more subtle one, which gets into issues of sort of analysis and why we need to be more formal with our discussions here, is that probability is additive for countable disjoint unions. Um, so what this says is that if I've got a collection of events, so again, these are, are elements of our curly E collection, A1 through AN on ad infinitum, and I have the additional property that these events are all disjoint. So meaning whenever I look at two subsets that have different indices, uh, i not equal to j, 
then those subsets of omega are disjoint, meaning their intersection is empty. That's indicated by this empty set symbol here. So under those two assumptions, we have this countability and this disjointness, then I can write that the probability of the union of these events uh, is equal to the sum of these probabilities. All right, so, and in particular, uh, this value is well-defined. So, so, you know, it's not always true that you can sum up a bunch of numbers less than one and get a number that's less than one. Um, so this is really uh, telling you something about the, the convergence of this, of this series. Um, but, you know, the big picture you want to have here is that we've got this event space, which is our universe, omega, um, and we can talk about events being subsets, A and B, and we're now going to perform basic operations on these subsets. Now, uh, just to connect with, again, some higher mathematics that's um, pertinent to some of the uh, analysis that's necessary when doing functional analysis, some of the things that underlie a lot of techniques from machine learning. Um, you, know, you should think of probability as, as an instance of a measure space, but where we have this extra normalization property. Um, this is sometimes goes under the heading that says that our collection of subsets of omega uh, uh, curly E is what's called a sigma algebra. So a sigma algebra um, is basically a collection of subsets where omega is part of the, that collection. It's closed under complements, meaning that if A is in your collection, then the complement of A is in your collection. Remember, the complement is just everything that's not that's in omega but not in A. So in particular, it's defined relative to the universe that it belongs in. And then we also have this uh, closed center countable unions condition. So the definition of a sigma algebra is necessary for talking about uh, defining what is a measure space. And a measure space historically was our attempt to formalize how can we define volume um, in situations that you know, we don't have a lot of geometry and could be really large infinite dimensional spaces. Um, of course, volume came to us in sort of simple situations like cubes and things like that. Um, but then calculus allowed us to, to basically define volume for you know, things we can't even see, like we talked about with the curse of dimensionality and these five dimensional spheres and things like that. Um, um, and again, calculus is then properly built on the foundation of measure theory. Anyhow, um, one thing you should just always know is if you have this notion of sort of a measure, um, um, which I just indicate with these vertical bars, um, that's telling you essentially volume, um, then we can turn this into a probability measure just by sort of normalizing. Um, and so here I've used this sort of shorthand that probability of A is equal to the measure of A divided by the measure of the universe, similarly with B. All right, so I know I've already thrown a lot of pretty highfalutin terms at you, and you're not really going to need a lot of these um, now, but I'm doing this as a service so that uh, hopefully when you read more math uh, related to machine learning and data science, um, it feels a little more accessible to you. Um, so the term sigma algebra, which we just used uh, when talking about a measure space, uh, is essentially a stronger version of what's called a Boolean algebra. Um, and Boolean algebra is, again, something you should, should at least have passing familiarity with. But let's step back for a second. So let's think about well, what is an algebra? Well, we know what we talk about usually when we discuss algebra. Um, we think about things like multiplication and addition. Um, so you might ask, is there a precise analogy to be made here? Um, and, and maybe there is. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just encourage you so to think about the first two requirements of a Boolean algebra is that you have this and or, and or operation. Um, so and essentially says something like, if I have A and B, I want to think of that as uh, the intersection of these two subsets. This is the event where both A and B occur. Um, uh, in some probability texts, you actually see them write this as A times B. So in that sense, this and operation, you can almost think of as a multiplication operation. Um, additionally, we need to have this or operation. Uh, which basically says if I have two elements of my, my collection of subsets, um, I can talk about their or uh, or union. 
And this is basically the event where either A or B occurs. This is the setting where there's probably a close analogy to be made with addition, because you're adding to A the possibility of B occurring. And then additionally, we have uh, not. Um, so the not operation uh, is essentially the one that uh, looks at the complement of an event. Um, and again, luckily Kolmogorov's axioms um, imply for us that uh, not only do we have a Boolean algebra of events, um, uh, we also have this additional requirement of uh, infinite unions or countable unions. Uh, anyhow, you want to think of Boolean algebra as sort of being coded in these uh, various rules of probability, which is that you know, the probability of A and B, you can think of it as the measure of A and B divided by the measure of the universe. And you can always go from the probability of an event to the probability of the event not occurring, which is one minus that probability. So I've tried to summarize all this in a picture here for you. All right. Sorry about that. So now if we, we want to put all this together to define conditional probability, we can now have a little more formal language we can use. So conditional probability basically takes the perspective that um, we're going to condition on a certain event B occurring. Um, so in some sense, you want to think of this as restricting your discourse of probability um, to be in a smaller universe um, where essentially you've already assumed that B occurs. All right, so said a little more formally, um, if, we're, if we're moving from this probability space, omega, where omega consists of our uh, space of all possible events, um, uh, or I should say it's sort of the collection of points where outcomes lie, and then curly E, which be, is our space of all possible events, and P is the probability of any one of those events occurring, it's a function from E into a real line. Um, then we can pass to another probability space where we look at subsets drawn from B, which is simply done by taking every element of our curly set E and intersecting with B. And then um, we'll now talk about this restricted function, um, probability function by B condition, P conditioned on B. And we can now use this definition that probability of A conditioned on B. Um, well, what we do is we first intersect A with B and then look at the probability of that event. This numerator is well-defined. And then we also use the fact that the denominator is well-defined as well. So in particular, we need to assume that B is actually a possible event as well, meaning that B is part of B. All right. So sort of bringing things down uh, to the more, most basic level, you can see, think of the sort of probability of B occurring even that A has by, by just sort of flipping some of these things around. So, so notice that we have this sort of symmetry in the fact that A and B is the same thing as B and A. So in particular, I can define uh, the conditional probability of B occurring, assuming A occurs using this equation. Notice the denominator is now P of A rather than P of B as it was back here. So notice P of A and B divided by P of B versus P of A and B divided by P of A. So you, sort of have, you have a different thing to condition on. Um, alternatively, you can think of this as the probability of B occurring given A times probability of A with the probability of both of them occurring, probability of A and B. All of this is sort of necessary for framing one of the most important rules in probability, which is Bayes rule. So famous that it's in fact been encoded in neon signs and parodied on the internet as Bayes theorem, uh, which you might enjoy looking up. Anyhow, uh, there it is in neon, or I've written it down here in LaTeX below. So probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times probability of A divided by probability of B. Essentially what this means is that the conditional is not symmetric. So you can't just flip your conditional willy nilly, meaning that you can't go from P of A given B to P of B given A, unless you normalize by the ratio of their volumes. Um, where again, we can think of 
P of A and P of B as being our volumes uh, or measures associated to these subsets. All right, so let's find out a little bit more about this uh, mystery character, Bayes. Um, so funnily enough, uh, Thomas Bayes was actually a preacher, um, a, a minister, to be more precise, a British statistician, mathematician, philosopher um, from early 1700s, 1701 to 1761. Um, and nowadays, Bayesian probability is sort of uh, grown up into a philosophy of its own, um, even though what Bayes was credited with was solving a very particular problem. Um, often you'll think of Bayesian probability as being put in contention with uh, fre frequentist probability. Um, so Bayesian probability takes at least nowadays is, says we should take the interpretation of this p function, this is our probability function, uh, as representing degrees of belief that an event occurs. Uh, by contrast, uh, the frequentism uh, basically takes the perspective that all probability is is measurement of frequency of events when we perform an experiment enough times. Uh, now, of course, there are problems with both of these approaches, um, in particular with the frequentists. If you always think of your probabilities as empirically derived, meaning that you actually perform the experiment a bunch of times, um, how do you know you've actually done it enough times? And how do you know you're not in some weird universe where your experiment gave you sort of faulty measures of what the probability is? Um, moreover, sort of Bayesian probability, um, in some sense, is the only one that can handle situations where repeated experiments are impossible. Uh, and uh, this is sometimes uh, epitomized in the following question, what is the probability of life on Mars? So we as English speakers take it for granted that this is a well-formulated question or, or sentence um, and, and use of the term probability. Uh, now, if we were a frequentist, we would take the perspective that to answer this question, I would need to create a bunch of mini Big Bangs, um, see in how many of those universes uh, life on Mars developed, count them up, and then divide by the number of times we re-ran the simulation of the universe. Um, Bayesian probability says, no, 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 it's okay just to use degrees of belief. Uh, so we believe that conditions that are suitable for life are in these parameters and um, we have some sort of squishiness about how much uh, we believe in those parameters, and then we evaluate them in the setting of Mars. All right. But key thing, if you want to understand Bayesian probability, is to be able to uh, understand or speak Bayesian, which involves using language like posteriors and priors and likelihoods and, pri and prior probabilities. Um, so let's. So let's go ahead and um, uh, go through these particular examples. So, so we'll get into this more in the next lecture, but the basic idea here is that I've got Bayes rule. I'm trying to say what's the probability of A given B, and I say I'm only, I only know the probability of B given A, and then maybe the respective probabilities, probability of A and B. So the, the whole idea here is that um, we actually are gonna interpret um, A as sort of some sort of uh, hypothesis or sort of conjecture about, uh, let's say our class label. Um, so this is the posterior probability of a class A, which we think of as a target variable, given B, which is sort of features or attributes, um, that's our data. So given, given data, how do we update our models um, to give a, a better estimate of the probability of our class label, which I think it was A. Um, anyhow, the uh, P of B we want to interpret in this setting is just the prior probability of, of a class label. So this just means without any evidence, prior, a priori, before observing, before gathering evidence, it's prior, a priori, um, versus P of A given B, which is posterior, post gathering evidence. Um, so we also have this interpretation of P of B given A as the likelihood, um, which is the probability of a predictor given, uh, 
given our class information. Um, and then additionally, we have the underlying probability of this, uh, of this predictor, um, which we think of as uh, A, which being, again, is our class label. So let's get into a little more uh, detail about what are each of these things. And uh, I'll encourage you to uh, uh, seek out these 1805 lecture notes um, where we sort of rewrite A and B, which we think of as events, elements of this sigma algebra of, of sets, um, and instead take much more squishy interpretations uh, where we think of A as some sort of hypothesis and D as data. Um, and uh, this page here has a nice translation of, of each of these uh, each of these things. Um, and it goes on to give sort of a comparison of uh, Bayesian schools of thought from versus uh, frequentist schools of thought. All right, so back to the lecture. All right, so let's now make all this discussion a lot more concrete. We are, we are here for data science, so let's try to understand um, these concepts in the context of data science. So, you know, we already thought about <clears throat> L as a class label, so let's go ahead and use the letter L um, to refer to sort of our label. Uh, and so we're basically asking what's the probability of a label given some observed features. Again, this is the uh, ultimate quest of science. Um, you know, we've given some observations and now we're trying to ask well, what's the probability of, of it being classified in a certain way. And so Bayes' theorem tells us that, well, we need to somehow figure out the probability of features divided by the label, uh, condition on that it being that label, and then talk multiply by this prior probability of the class label, and then divide by somehow this probability of features. Um, so let's go ahead and, and try to make this more specific. So in the case where we have n features, um, so we think of this as n columns in our data matrix, um, and let's suppose there are k possible labels. Uh, then we can think of the posterior probability of our class label y i as being given by, uh, again, conditioned on our observed features x1 through xn. Well, in terms of notation, we just write it as probability of class label conditioned on these observations. Well, this is equal to the probability of those features conditioned on our, our class label. So meaning if we somehow knew ahead of time that, ah, you know, if we knew or we had some training that told us that all right, this collection of samples all belong to class label YI, um, you know, what's the, the frequency of, of the sort of uh, times where those, those features or something like those features are, are observed? Um, that's going to be right here, times just sort of the probabil prior probability of that class label, and then again just divided by the probability of sort of those, those observations um, without any conditioning. So, so part of the problem here um, with or one of the problems with Bayesian classification is that you know, some parts of the, that equation are easy to estimate. So for example, um, P of YI, um, which is the probability of our class label YI, it's easy to estimate simply by just looking at how many, let's say in my training data set, how many times did my, uh, did my sample have class label YI? Um, so again, we can create sort of a histogram and, and address issues that are sometimes called class imbalance. Uh, but one of the, the trickier things to do here is, is estimate this, uh, this conditional probability. So this is the probability of an observation based on the class. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, you know, we don't, <clears throat> we don't really, uh, uh, unless we, again, have a large sample set and we're, we're able to train and make, try to make some inferences or guesses as to what, uh, these probability distribution on features are conditioned on each of these uh, YIs, these class labels. Uh, uh, this can be a, a difficult thing to estimate from data. 
And so, so one, one thing we see here is um, sort of this uh, supposed uh, death sentence for, for direct application of Bayes' theorem because uh, we, we have no way of figuring out how to, how to actually compute this. So this is where we introduce an assumption. Um, and this is, again, the naive Bayes assumption. So we can circumvent that problem by essentially assuming uh, independence of features um, across each of those coordinates. So, so essentially what we can do is then and just figure out, all right, let's assume the following. So the data input values, so these features are independent um, and we're actually gonna, they should say conditionally independent uh, based on the class label. And then we can uh, use this data to estimate the parameters of, of a, a single probability distribution. So we, we also need to sort of guess or uh, pick out ahead of time what is the, uh, the distribution that we, we think is going to govern, um, govern our classification task. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and do that. Um, but let's just go ahead and, and also state you know, what is the consequence of the naive Bayes assumption? So if we assume that these features are conditionally independent, so mean, meaning that each of these coordinates um, in my data matrix are, are actually independent um, uh, when conditioned on the class label, yi, um, then, then we end up having the following equation, which is that the probability of a class label uh, given my observation is proportional to the probability of each uh, feature conditioned on each of these class labels all multiplied together times, of course, the probability of that class label. Uh, here we're, we're missing uh, the final part of Bayes' theorem, and that's why I use this proportional to symbol prop slash prop to in LaTeX. Um, we have forgotten the normalizing factor of dividing by the probability, the total probability of that individual observation. So just as a quick conceptual question, um, you know, suppose you're given uh, a sample, an observation, <clears throat> how would we choose the, uh, the, which label to use, assuming that we were given this, this observation? So meaning, so how might we uh, go ahead and, and pick our favorite class label across all these different features uh, when we're given these features. Well, in essence, you're, you're essentially just trying to figure out what, what maximizes um, uh, this function here on the, on the right. Uh, and again, this is, uh, this is lots of ways of doing that, but you're, you're sort of gonna go with the, uh, whichever thing seems uh, most likely given, given the data. All right, so. so let's go ahead and, and get a little more particular about some of the distributions before we get to our, our, our final example. So here are some types of distributions which sometimes uh, are used in, in classification problems. So sometimes we're interested in binary classification. So this is basically is someone Democrat, Republican, uh, is it a point red or blue? Um, you know, when I flip this coin, does it come up heads or tails? These are all instances of, of sort of Bernoulli outcomes, which when summed over a large number of samples uh, is governed by the binomial distribution. Now there's a natural generalization of the binomial distribution to settings where there are more than just two class labels. Um, and this is the setting of, of the multinomial distribution, which is uh, something we're gonna be using next. The basic idea behind the multinomial distribution is that you don't have just the two options, head or tails, you might have, uh, or red and blue, you might have red, blue, and green. And so let's, uh, we'll go through a little bit more detail how that's defined. Um, but of course, when we're looking at um, uh, uh, maybe more like regression problems and we're interested in classifying labels which have this sort of numeric, uh, you can also use Gaussian distributions. 
All right, so, so those sort of give us our, our three major branches of sort of doing data science classification, which also includes regression as, as, a, as the case when the class label is continuously varying. All right, so, so as a, just a quick uh, recap, you could think of the multinomial distribution as being the thing which governs um, distributions across several outcomes. Um, so for example, if I imagine I have like three urns in front of me and I just sort of are throwing them somehow randomly um, and I'm asking about what's the distribution across these three urns uh, when I throw, let's say, not in balls, like it's the probability of having, you know, K1, K2, K3 uh, number of balls inside of urn one, urn two, urn three. Uh, and of course, then, you know, if I remove an urn and I'm only putting balls in two urns, uh, then, then this is sort of a classical binomial distribution. And we can tune the parameter bias for which which ball is an urn more likely to go into. Um, but let's look at an even more real world example. So, so here we're going to be looking at something called the uh, the news group data set. So the basic idea here with the news group data set is that we're going to have a bunch of uh, text or sentences, uh, documents, um, and they are distributed across 20 different news groups. So just like we have our, our 20 urns, um, we want to use this multinomial distribution. Um, and so, so the, the news group data set has essentially uh, something like 18,000 news group posts uh, split across 20 sort of topics or news groups. Um, and so, so then we can essentially treat that distribution of documents across these news groups and then use that to uh, uh, give a prior model for our uh, uh, distribution of documents across our news group data set. And now we're going to be able to use this um, to do then prediction where imagine I give you a little bit of text um, and I then ask you, uh, which news group do you think this text was posted in? All right, so let's actually go through that and do some do some code. So, all right, so again, this is actually again another built-in data set. So we have side of the uh, twenty news groups, and you can see uh, that the target names are possible class labels uh, are, are strings, um, and they're they're strings that have a very particular form. We've got. Uh, essentially these news group uh, headings or titles. Uh, this is basically uh, Reddit before there was Reddit. Um, so there's alternative topics on atheism, computers, graphics, OS, Windows, IBM, PC hardware, Mac hardware, Windows X, miscellaneous for sale. And then we've also got uh, recreation, autos, motorcycles, sports, specifically baseball, sports, specifically hockey, um, I got some science, I think referring to cryptography, uh, electronics, medicine, space. We also got uh, uh, some sort of social um, news group, uh, specifically a religious one focusing on Christian. Um, and then we've got politics uh, with guns, uh, so political viewpoints on guns, um, pol political viewpoints in the Mideast. Um, miscellaneous political opinions, and then also uh, a miscellaneous talk on religion. All right, so, so try to keep in mind, we've got these 20 options of, uh, of, of news groups. We're going to try to do text prediction. Um, so our, our observation is going to be give you a bit of text, and now you have to predict uh, which, which group did that bit of text appear in. All right, so so we'll go ahead and, and just for the sake of concreteness, um, uh, focus on a, a smaller uh, set of, of topics. And so um, we'll just look at the following four groups. So talk.religion, um, talk, and then social, religion, Christian, 
science, talking about space and computer graphics. Um, and that's going to be, uh, those are going to be the, the four categories where we're sort of, um, in some sense, restricting our, our problem now to just those four news groups instead of all 20. Um, and so, so we're going to go ahead and, and make our training data set to be the training portion of text from just those four groups or categories. And we're also going to have our test uh, data set, which is going to have um, this is the test portion in from again those just those four categories. Make sure we got that in there. All right, so let's just look at say uh, some of the. So again, we want to follow the data science pipeline. So let's check out the data. Um, so let's see what happens if I uh, look at eight. Oh wow, was not expecting this. Um, so Dan at ingress.com wrote in response to Christian extremist kills doctor. Um, and then he goes on to say something, uh, blah, blah, blah. So you see that Griffin didn't have saved the lives of children. He did destroy life of man. So on superficial levels, he's scum. And then, all right. So, so again, long, again, you can imagine how this uh, was basically long form Reddit or Twitter back in the day. Um, maybe there's something nicer here. Uh, train donut, if there were no hell. Okay. Nuclear waste. Um, okay, so feel free to explore this data set um, and in particular look at the training data set. And, and again, these are just indexing the rows um, and we've got this huge string, which is basically an email uh, associated to, to each of, in each of these rows. All right, so one of the biggest tasks in data science um, involves sort of featureization. So right now we've got this sample, this row in this training data set, which is this huge document. Um, I mean, at least huge by Twitter comparisons. And, and what we need to do is now figure out how do we vectorize? How do we featureize this data? Um, so again, this data is just, just uh, an email. And so what we want to do is convert it into a vector of numbers, convert the string into a vector of numbers. So, so one approach to do this, um, sometimes called TF-IDF, which is a term frequency, uh, inverse document frequency. So, so basically the idea here is that we, you know, maybe get rid of really common words because we don't expect that to, to help distinguish documents, words like A and the. Uh, what, you know, things like this. And now take, uh, take words which are sort of less frequent, but somehow have strong distinguishing power. Uh, you know, things like you know, Christian or religion, etc. So, you know, obviously those would be the things which help pick out topics in each of those categories. Uh, uh, essentially the way that this works is we want to uh, weigh the word, weigh how much this uh, this word count um, by in terms of how often they appear in documents. So, so this essentially means that often rare words are going to be more of interest um, in, in the grand scheme of things. All right, but uh, but again, I leave it to you to look up and read a little bit more about how TFIDF works. Um, for our purposes, we're just going to use the um, the built-in pipeline. Um, uh, so, so again, uh, scikit-learn has this pipeline functionality, um, and it's got both uh, a multinomial naive Bayes, which is going to be the sort of classifier we use, and then uh, we need to do some featureization first. So we have to uh, vectorize, and we're going to use this TFIDF uh, in order to vectorize this. So our pipeline, our model, is that we're going to first Take our samples. We're going to vectorize these emails, these Usenet, these uh, newsgroup posts, <clears throat> using this TFIDF um, feature generator, and then we're going to perform our our multinomial uh, naive Bayes classifier on this on this data. Right, so again, that's relatively quick. All right, and so now we do our same train uh, model predict, and so. In this step, we actually fit 
our, our model, just like we do with pretty much every scikit-learn uh, model to our training data uh, along with its training target. So remember the data here consists of the emails uh, and then the target consists of uh, one of those four in general 20 news groups. And then we're going to take our test data and then try to predict uh, what, what happens here. So, so let's see uh, what this looks like. And again, one of the ways to evaluate performance of your of your classification algorithms is to is consider what's called the confusion matrix. So I run that here. Um, you'll see that there's there is a fair bit of confusion. Um, I believe this is actually our accuracy here, um, but let's let's inspect this a little bit uh, more deeply. So, so for these computer graphics posts, um, that's the true label. Um, if we were to sum all the entries here, it looks like three hundred and forty-four plus thirteen makes three fifty-seven, makes plus thirty-two, um, makes three eighty-nine. Oh, so 344 out of 389 of those posts got correctly predicted um, with some misclassification errors, which landed in um, science.space. And uh, weirdly enough, um, this society, religion, Christian. So maybe that makes sense. Um, um, but I'm a little hard pressed to figure out why uh, computer graphics posts would get more misclassified there. Okay, so then uh, science on space, uh, again, mostly actually one of our more accurate categories. Um, actually, society, religion, Christian um, is predicted almost 100% accuracy. Uh, uh, Talk.religion.miscellaneous had a high rate of misclassification. So you can see this red here is indicating there is a lot of errors. Um, errors, again, are things that are off the diagonal. <clears throat> So basically, a lot of talk.religion.miss posts got classified as uh, society.religion.christian. Um, all right, so that, that's sort of interesting. You might ask yourself, well, how, how can we uh, uh, maybe do better? Well, let's, uh, let's have a little more fun. So, so let's go ahead and, and try to run through. Uh, let's just generate our own string. Um, and then using that string, <clears throat> Uh, that's going to be our new test data. So, so text is one of these instances where um, we don't need to be so um, uh, scarce or, or frugal, I should say, with our with our our, our data, um, because it's easy to collect more text, um, and in particular, we can generate our own text in this example. So, how does this work? So, we have this function predict category, which takes in uh, uh, a string. And then it, it sets these default parameters to be our training data set and our model. And so, so we've already created our instance of this model, which is this pipeline of TFIDF vectorization. And then it goes through the uh, multinomial naive Bayes classifier. All right, so, and then you can see the way this works is, you know, we take in our model and then we predict <clears throat> using S and that's going to pass through this pipeline of vectorize using TFIDF and then do multinomial naive Bayes. Uh, and that's going to return a predicted label. And then um, now we just look at uh, train.target names and then we look at uh, this predict and we look in the zeroth entry. So it's going to give us just one, one returned uh, value. And, and then it's going to then tell us what the name the name is of that. All right, so let's uh, let's see how this works. Let's have some fun. So uh, let's imagine we run this function on uh, sending a spaceship somewhere. All right, great. It successfully predicted that uh, we have science.space. Seems like a reasonable bet. What about uh, discussing Islam versus atheism? OK, so science.religion, that Christian. Again, that's probably one of those misclassification errors where 
probably belongs to that talk.religion.miss uh, miscellaneous. But as we saw in that confusion matrix, there was a huge uh, misclassification there. Um, all right, let's see, determining the screen resolution. Yeah, that seems like a computer graphics uh, thing to say. And what about uh, Beyonce is one of the lizard people? So probably conspiracy mumbo jumbo, um, probably more of a talked out religion that missed thing. But um, again, since there was a high misclassification, uh, it makes sense that this, uh, this got predicted as being in our uh, Christian news group. All right, so that's it for today. Um, but as a quick recap, um, if you want to use naive bays, it's really good when you've got well separated categories. Um, such as these news group uh, labels. Um, and we can make sort of naive assumptions that ideally match uh, our expectations of the data. Um, uh, for very well separated categories when the model complexity is less important. And additionally, um, uh, because we're using probability and not so much uh, the sort of, in, and often doing this in terms of things proportional to samples, not, not proportional to say feature dimension, um, uh, this means that naive Bayes works really well in a uh, high dimensional setting. So when our, our vectorization um, is, is very high dimensional. Um, and some of these things were, uh, were borrowed from some other places. Um, so I leave it to you to uh, refer to some of those links. So I look forward to seeing you in class where we can uh, have some more fun with the naive Bayes classifier. Uh, see you soon.